Hello. Is the sound level okay? So, my subject for tonight was resilience and leadership. And the first principle of war is selection and maintenance of the aim, and you shouldn't have a split aim. So I will talk for the reasons that um, Marina has suggested more about resilience than I will about leadership, and for the reasons which are explained here. I have an hour, which is nothing like enough. And I've talked on this subject quite a lot of late, both to cohorts from the RDE, but more generally. Um, and sometimes, like Fidel Castro, for three hours. Mm. So um, I won't push my luck this evening, but I may go on until you tell me to stop. So perhaps for an hour and a half, depending. We'll see where we get to. I have a debt of gratitude to the RDE. Um, f for a time, I was responsible for commando training, and in the process of which, with all due care and respect, we broke a lot of boys. And you unfailingly, and with great love and care and devotion, put them back on their feet again. And from a personal perspective, you have also looked after my family. Two years ago, my mother died in this hospital at 87, and you showed her great kindness and respect. So um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I know you've had various other people come and talk. And um, I suspect a lot of you have read Caroline Elton's book. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not, I'm not trained in psychology. Um, but I made a lot of mistakes in life. I've lived a, a life, I've lived quite a busy and varied life, but an, an extraordinarily unsuccessful life. And if I could live it again, I would make enormous changes. So I don't stand here pontificating from a position of strength, much more a position of weakness. Um, so I was a Marine. I am a Marine. It's like the Jesuits. You can't, <laughs> you can't take it back. Once they've got you, they've got you for life. Um, you should under-promise and over-deliver. That's also a sort of informal um, principle of war. And um, Marina just kindly threw me under the bus with her introduction. So you will now be expecting something which you certainly won't receive. So I'm going to rebalance that by explaining that, like the medical profession, the military love their acronyms. And Marine is, in fact, an acronym for muscles are required, intelligence not essential. <laughs> So if, you're look, so if you're looking for enlightenment, you're more likely to find it under your chair than by looking at me. So I joined the Corps for four years and stayed for 34. Why? Because it was an environment of belonging, purpose, identity, and trust. And those four things are immensely powerful and compelling. The brotherhood of the shared ordeal and ideal, where people would die retrieving the body parts of their comrades from the battlefield. And when you become a, a civilian, which I are now, the transition while you're in is called going outside. And until you go outside, in inverted commas, you never ever really think about what that means. But it is actually an extraordinary sort of shutting of a door. After being a bootneck, I became the chief executive of an island, well, wrong, of a hybrid philanthropic 
commercial company which sustainably developed Jurassic Park, the island of Principe in the Gulf of Guinea, which is one of the more remote and beautiful and unspoiled places of Africa. And we saw it as a sort of provocation to mankind as to how you could live happily and well without wrecking the planet. So I'm, I've always been an environmentalist. I read chemistry for my sins, completely incomprehendingly. But the bit that I just about grasped between reading wine bottle labels as well was the environmental bit. And so um, I was privileged to do that for three years as well. So this is Hemingway. distilled out of the bitter mash of all his previous mistakes. And, and I sort of touched on the fact that I have lived an unsuccessful life, um, which I have. Um, my father was an alcoholic who beat us. My sister committed suicide at the age of 26. So there was an element of sort of mental instability. My grandfather was a depressive. I'm a depressive. Um, Probably my biggest shame is that I've been divorced twice. I never expected that. I've been resuscitated three times. I've tried to commit suicide three times by drowning. Good opportunity to give yourself time. My sister hanged herself. Air is less forgiving. So I don't stand here pretending that I understand life. But I do stand here, still here and having sort of tripped over most of the things that one can, however high or low. So a bit of teleology, a bit of pedantry on my part. That's what resilience is. It's the capacity to recover. Because <clears throat> a lot of people see it as an issue of sort of strength, robustness. It sort of is robustness, but it's much more about flexibility and suppleness of picking yourself up physically and metaphorically than it is about sort of granite-like toughness. There's an adage also in the military which says you go with what you've got. So on any given day, whatever resource you have to hand emotionally physically, intellectually, is what you muster for the fight. Because we sometimes have these resolutions. I make 12 resolutions a year, because if you make one by mid-January, you've always broken it. So I spread bet, and I put them on the cupboard in the kitchen. And then you can sort of nudge them along and feel better about yourself, because some of them will sort of progress. And you try and c couch them in terms that are positive, you don't want to be giving things up because that's much harder than sort of... Martin Luther King said that a vision is a target that beckons. What's the relevance? And I'm going to wander around in this thing because that's what I do. You'll follow it. What's the relevance of this? Well, into every life a little rain must fall and you need to fix the roof before it starts to rain because you'll go with what you've got. And if you postpone the moment where you actually think about some of these things, and people will go through life, the busyness of life, the long littleness of life, desperately trying to avoid a lot of things. They don't want to stir up the porridge. And introspection, Anthony Clare, some of the people in the audience here are old enough to know about Anthony Clare and in the psychiatrist's chair. It was an incredibly compelling radio program and one of his he was asked at the end of his career what his his prescription for happiness was and one of them was don't be too introspective so there's a balance but you need to think about some of the things that make you you and the things that you value and the things that you're proud of because when you hit big hiccups it's too late when the water's running through the roof Sorry, I'm blinding you. Me and technology, never a good combination. So this is quite an interesting exercise. Who's done this? 
Who's put time on the x-axis and happiness and unhappiness on the y-axis? It's a way of trying to understand your life. Has anybody done it? It's quite a standard sort of exercise. Quite a, so that's mine. <laughs> Interesting, eh? You can probably imagine at the bottom of the large tooth, which almost touches the bottom, what happened there. The instructive thing, and this is not some sort of strange oversharing that I'm doing here, where you, whilst you sit uncomfortably thinking, this guy's a weirdo, he's told me a lot more about himself than I ever really needed to know. The instructive thing about that, and I did it with a completely open mind, and you can see it's pretty <coughs> in inelegantly drawn, is the speed of oscillation. You're sort of bimbling along just about okay above the line, and then suddenly out of a clear blue sky. And you can say, well, actually, if you were properly resilient, that wouldn't happen. But I regarded myself for many, many years as one of the most resilient people I've ever met. I've been to war seven times. I've seen awful things. I've watched people blown apart and mutilated. I've helped them. And I've largely speaking, speaking been fine throughout. And then somewhere along the line, that happened. Instructive. So I was a brigadier in Canada before I went off to, or expected to go off after a year of training to command the Hellman Task Force, which was a group of people doing the hard yards in southern Afghanistan, or the 34 provinces. It was the most kinetic. And I was going to go climbing, because I'm a mountaineer out of, out of passion. I was the Royal Marines mountain leader. And I thought, no, no, I can't do that. I'm meant to be responsible. Act your age and not your shoe size, as my children used frequently to tell me. So I went water skiing on this lake. And in the process of which, behind a 140 horsepower outboard engine, I struck a, a log submerged in the water. When you're, there are lots of medics in the audience, and you'll no doubt put me right, who is a doctor here, just so I know how much risk I'm under? Oh, good. <laughs> okay, I shall choose my layman's terms very carefully. When your heart dies before your brain, death is an extraordinarily painful thing. It was like having a vice wrapped around my head. And I did see this which is my brain dying, I guess. But I didn't hear celestial choirs, so I've tried to live better since. I don't know if you can comment on that. <laughs> and I ended up in hospital for 14 days in intensive care and then seven months in a wheelchair, which was a deeply instructive and useful thing, actually. It made me realize how impossible the camber on the average pavement is. <laughs> It made me appreciate far better the steely boys who suffered far greater and more egregious injury than I. So I learned from it. And my then wife put an image of a tree which meant a great deal to us on the top of the Radden Hill above Thorberton. There's a lonesome pine tree. Lots of people appropriate it, but actually it's mine. <laughs> And she said, whilst I was unconscious, one day you will walk again to that tree. Eight months later, I did. A vision is a target that beckons. Symbolism is really important in life, really important. And in a working environment, I've spent, I've spent quite a lot of time talking to organizations about how you, how you enthuse people how you inspire people, how you build a sense of collective identity and will and passion. You have all given your lives to something which is vocational. 74% of people in Britain last year, adults, admitted to being overwhelmed by life. 63% said that if they could change their job tomorrow, they would. 62% in a separate survey said that they had to completely change the way they behaved when they went to work. They live an inauthentic life. The 
pressure of an inauthentic life. So when you go through a big hiccup, it is actually worth being reflective about what you draw from it and setting a, if you like, a sort of marker in the sand, a marker of resilience, which says, saving your presence, that was fucking awful, but here I stand. Here I stand. And when I look back on that reference point, I prevailed over it. When I came round from, from my chemically induced coma or whatever it was, they said I would be paralysed, incontinent and impotent. Not as bad as when. But it's worth thinking about that. What was the worst moment you had? There are soldiers in the audience here. And the experience of training is about incrementally placing pressure on you such that you know always that you can prevail over it. And when you go into the anarchy of war, the complete sort of terra incognita of something which has no rules and no laws and no certainty, you have enough confidence and enough gists, enough dexterity to be able to manage the, the, the entropic nature of what you're doing. And if your training has taken you to a point where you know you can run with 100 pounds for five hours, you can endure on one hour sleep for seven days and still think and be sentient and, and competent. That gives you great confidence. There will be times when you step beyond that. So there, here's your marker. And now I'm here and I'm in Syria. And now I'm in terra incognita, but I can still see the mug. I get to here. And I've managed and I've prevailed. And now my marker is here. But it needs to be a conscious thing. It needs to be a conscious thing. You need to think about that and understand it and mark it. And use that knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge dispels fear. That was the motto of number two parachute training company. Knowledge dispels fear. We always thought it was the other way around. <laughs> <coughs> Confidence is a really strange thing. It's both macro and micro. If you wake up in the morning and you shut your fingers in the door. You cut your face when you're shaving. You lose your keys. You wake up five minutes late. You quite often never catch up that five minutes. If you start your day in a rush, you feel off balance. You have a communication with somebody you usually trust, which doesn't quite work the way you expect it to. And you have that sort of sense of unease, which can perpetuate. And then you go to bed, and every day is a new day. And the sunshine <coughs> comes out, and the swallows are still here. Or not. And the following day, you lose your bank card. Or you have an argument in, in the office. Or you make a call, or you try and intubate with somebody, and it doesn't work. So on a daily cycle, minor. On a larger level, small grains of sand falling. And the weird little things, it's like relationships that unravel. They don't tend to go wrong for big things. If you're, if you're unfaithful physically and you get caught out or you admit it, that can destroy a relationship quite adequately, I'm sure. But actually, most relationships fall, fail because of small things. Acts of harm, carelessness, unkindness. And confidence and trust are quite closely associated. And so this business of confidence, of, of the small things, of your sense of poise and balance being eroded, 
and understanding how small things over a long enough time can destabilize you and what you might do in order to buttress your sense of self within the environment and routine in which you work is also quite important, quite apart from skiing into a submerged log at 50 knots. So having a belief wall, one of the things I was really bad at was celebrating. Because we live, we're like hamsters. We're racing. We're always thinking about what comes next. The Romans described children as liberi, the free ones, because they lived in the moment. <clears throat> and as an adult, largely you're worrying about what you did and whether you did it right and well enough, especially in the sort of environments in which you work where there's great responsibility and jeopardy, or what's coming and whether you're prepared. The moving moment of your life is lost to you. There's an awful lot of psychobabble written about mindfulness, I think. They've made it a black art, which it needn't be. But the rudiments of it are profound. And the reason why it's all focused on breathing and feeling the weight through your feet and all the rest of it is just trying to centre you and bring your mind back to where you are. I was involved in some research done in uh, Georgetown University where profoundly um, upended United States Marines with suffering PTSD um, made remarkable unmedicated strides as a consequence of very simple, uncomplicated mindfulness training. So celebrating who you are and what you've achieved. A lot of soldiers have an I love me wall where you put pictures up or medals or whatever, back to symbolism. Moments that mattered. And we have lots of symbols. Napoleon said, if I had sufficient quantities of silk ribbon, I could get my men to do anything. Inventing your own symbolism is important. Marina, who I bear testament to, is wearing her badge of office tonight. Her predecessor never wore it, apparently. I said, you absolutely have to wear that. Symbolism is important. So celebrate your achievements. Mark them. Stick them on the wall. Have pictures of them. Write them down. Because they will also buttress your life. Scott. That's how he talked about his people when they died on the North Pole. The small quivering vanity which is I. That's a big old question that. What is it? What do you stand for? What would you fight for? What would you die for? I used to ask Marines that before we deployed to places like Afghanistan. And it's an uncomfortable question. It's like, well, hang on a minute. You know, you're about to depart with a one in six chance of getting blown up every day to Sangin. 257 soldiers and Marines were killed in Sangin during the Afghan war. 257. Absolutely non-existent little village. But it's symbolic. And the Taliban will fight over a garden shed. And once you start fighting over a garden shed, it becomes much more than a garden shed. And I used to say to them, so when you deploy, are you prepared to lose a leg? Are you prepared to lose a leg? It's the nature of young men to think they're invulnerable. So they deploy always think, thinking they'll come back in one piece. But many don't. And if I ask a question of an audience like this, it's even further outside your sort of realm of experience. You think, well, hang on a minute. I'm a doctor. What are you talking about? Shut up. But if I said, so you're all doctors, and they're all doctors. I'm going to be fine if I'm sick in future, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> if I asked you how many of you had kids, how many of you had kids? And how many of you would die for your children? Yeah. You, don't even, you don't hesitate, do you? Don't hesitate. So if you know that, 
What else might you know about yourself if you actually delved around to figure out what matters? What matters? So there we are, racing away on the hamster wheel. Racing away. One of the things I feel strongly about is that when people, the most interesting people I meet in life in their 60s and 70s still haven't figured out what they want to be. And I think, in some respects, it's an inept question for this audience. I should be standing up rather than lounging on my table. Because you're, you are vocational. You, I make the bold assumption, from the age of 14, studied your little buns off to get straight A stars in everything, to become a doctor. But people lose their way. The average age of a G female GP renouncing her profession now is what? 42. 42. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that you were joking, sir. 37. So let's make the assumption that she qualifies at 30. <laughs> And that's not about any other reason than I've had enough, I've had enough, enough already. And that's not a gender, that's not a gender bias comment. I don't know what the statistic for males is. There's probably a whole load of other factors that play into that, which shouldn't, but they do. For a lot of people, like this poor man in Manila, they pull barrels all their lives without any idea what's in them. You are fortunate to know that you make a profound difference. You deal with an increasingly demanding and ill-disciplined British public. I would say that as a retired military general, but they are. And the gentleman here who runs A&E, I suspect on a Saturday night, sees that more often than most. There's quite a good saying that if you are running up and down the corporate ladder, Make sure it's leaning against the right wall. <laughs> and so I think a really valuable piece of advice to your children is, you know, don't be in a hurry. It takes ages to figure out what you want to be, and there is so much pressure now. I tried so hard, my twin daughters, to persuade them to take a gap yaw, <laughs> which eventually they did. But the, you know, the siren voice of their school, which was shaking its head, saying, well, you know, you'll lose the habit of study. <sighs> Bollocks. That was my considered view. Expressed to the headmaster, he was appreciative. Yeah. <laughs> the man who mobilised the English language and led it into battle. So who here works? When I, there was a stage when I was in, in, at the end of my military career, when I had a brigade in Afghanistan. I was running the counter piracy operation in the Indian Ocean, responsible for policing 2.3 million square miles of water. I was running the Royal Navy on the Navy board. There were six of us, eight of us, and I was running the Royal Marines. So I used to work quite a lot. And probably my identity was very firmly tied up with work. And so would yours be. Because I am no longer, although in normally I'm a Marine, I am no longer a Marine, and I could feel that my identity went through quite a big wobble at that point. It is one small factor. So it's, it changes, age. You will know, as I did not, how important these are. We live in an increasingly secular society. As I get older, and it's not about the precautionary principle, I become more spiritual. I'm not sure why, well, I, I know why, but I don't have time to unpack that. This is quite important. I have a house full of junk. It's not to do with a belief wall. It's about, I am a magpie. And when I, you know, when I was in the Second Iraq War, I ate, shaved, washed. I can't think about any other unpleasant bodily functions. All done in a metal mug. 
I carried everything on my back. And I came home and I thought, what is all this stuff? So being thingless is fantastic. But it's also Chatwin. Anybody heard of Bruce Chatwin? Fantastic man. He talked about the fact that you needed to have a home in order to have adventures, in order to return to. And now that's all I have. I live on my own. I spent 12 days over Christmas. I didn't speak to anybody. I'm not going to do that again. But I have memories tied up in these things, which, I don't know. This is important as well. The only difference between a rut and a grave is the depth. <laughs> so make sure your habits are the right ones. Challenge them. Do things that frighten you. I sound hectic. That was me in a different life in Bali. This business of balance is a tricky one. Everything has an opportunity cost. Easier said than done that, isn't it? Being the funny side. Milan Kundra is on unbelievable lightness of being. We live in a linear reductionist Newtonian world, which is evidence-based, which is all about proof. But we also live in a post-truth age. And it's very confusing, isn't it? I haven't mentioned the B word. But you know, that seems to be a front and center issue which nobody understands and there is, is completely insoluble because you just don't know who to trust. So the military is big on when you're tired, frightened, hungry, cold, confused, having handrails. We have checklists to try and avoid error. And we have things that help us be within tolerance to make sensible decisions out of complicated, messy circumstances where you're essentially judging between wrong and wrong. Just as you probably are. People think that surgery, he's a surgeon here. So people think surgery is science and my understanding from the surgeons I've spoken to that it's much more art. And quite a lot of the time you don't have an answer to things if they go wrong. And so mili the military world is very similar. There's an awful lot of luck, there's quite a lot of guesswork, um, there's quite a lot of boldness. And anyway, so we have these checklists and we are very good at analytical thinking. We're very rigorous. And one of the, one of the wickets of progressing in the military is you have to go through these hideous staff colleges which last for years and they absolutely thrash you. And if you don't do well in them, then you don't progress. And the estimate process, you know, they'll set you a task where you have to analyze an extremely complicated thing and you have 24 hours to do it. So you work through the night and then you have to provide your solution. My view as I became more senior and experienced is that the, the, the Kleinsian thinking, naturalistic decision making, where you use the other side of your brain, your right sided brain, was quite as important, your intuition. And the reason why, because very often you've only got a minute, what are you going to do? Man's just been shot. What are you going to do? Second man's just been shot. Sniper's in that building. There are 30 people in that building, including children. Are you going to bomb the building? What are you going to do? Third man's just been shot. And the only way you end up with the confidence to know and to use your intuition is if you've used it and you're in the ballpark. So when you have the opportunity to analyze something with all the time in the world, bringing all the tools and expertise and knowledge you know, and, and consulting with colleagues and doing all these things. And the answer is seven. That's the answer. And you go, excellent. And you proceed comfortably and confidently. But on this occasion, you haven't got that time. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
and you go, uh, uh, nine. So when you have that opportunity, use your intuition, situate the appreciation, and say the answer's nine, and write it on a piece of paper. Then go and analyse it. And if the answer's seven, good enough. And the next time, you will, if you do that regularly, you will end up with the confidence to act. Because the first responsibility, truth and fury tactics. Second World War, blitzkrieg, of all German officers, was to act. When my mum died, she was my rod and star for my mother. She was a dancer in the Royal Ballet. She was a rock star. I found that picture, those pictures, in her desk. And the fact that they're in exactly the same pose with her hiding her rheumatoid arthritis hands. 40 years apart was entirely coincidental. Me at 18, clutching a video, looks as if I'm about to take back, and me with my mum having just been to Bucking Palace. And I put it up only because there's lots of bling and baubles in one. And you could say, well, you know, what does that betoke? My answer is absolutely nothing. Nothing. That's the bit that matters. The moving moment. The journey never ends well. So don't be, well, I guess it can win well. But don't be fixated on getting where you're going. It's taken me so long to realize that. And the wisest people I met, who some of them are quite young, have figured out that the yellow space is the bit that matters. So worry less. I want to put this in. Whale sounds. Anybody heard whale sounds? Amazing. You stick your head under water and it just vibrates. When I was in Principe, I used to run every night and swim with sharks. It used to scare the shit out of me. But it was a sort of test of will and character and I used to do it every night. And um, on one night, I was running up this hill, which is sort of one in one. It was a bit of a test of character, another reason to do it. Listening to Maria Callas, and then I dived into the water brilliantly with my iPod still attached, not so smart, and heard this and thought she's still singing. No, she isn't. So resilience starts with this. Um, this is my, you know, I would not be looking myself in the eye as an environmentalist. It starts with this, your environment, so look after it. And if there's one way of kind of putting yourself, so I did the West Highland Way two weeks ago, 100 miles from north of Glasgow to Port William. It rained every day, hurrah, that's Scotland. <laughs> and then as I came out through Glencoe, God's swords of light came lancing down. And it's such a banal thing, but most of what I've said is banal. The great, the great truths of life are banal. They're simple. They're not easy, but they're simple. They stand there. So, you know, trying to figure out what matters. Well, the simple things matter. And one of the reasons why, as you probably well know, more and more children are getting rickets now, bizarre rickets, <coughs> vitamin D deficiency is because they don't go out in the sunlight enough, becoming tools of their tools. They're welded to their QWERTY keyboards. And the greatest counterbalance to an awful lot of the anxieties of the modern world, I would suspect, is this. To all that endures and does not care for man, Gavin Maxwell. So, if 74% of people have felt overwhelmed last year as adults, how many people in this room have felt overwhelmed in the last year? Not many. Good for you. 
or you're just bullshitting me. <laughs> <laughs> so I've told you everything about myself, including the fact that I'm a suicide, or almost. And you guys are not even prepared to share the fact that at times you felt overwhelmed. The state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or demanding circumstances. Adverse or demanding circumstances. So I've spoken to about six different cohorts of people, all through consultants who came to a lecture I gave at Exeter University's business school. And over time, and this is yang, this is cup half empty, because the medical profession, you know, what you do is brilliant, and a lot of people are massively enthused, happy, striding forward in what they, they do. But those red lines, those red words, seem to be a reasonably sustainable consensus of those who are pilgrimaging through their rite of passage. And you can see rather sort of disturbingly the infinity sign, which sits within the realm of consultants who go on until they're shot. Um, but I don't know whether you recognize that or not. That's the sort of Caroline Elton narrative, I guess. And it's, a, it's not, not a positive one. I mean, you know, there's a balance. So when I joined the Royal Marines, this was the recruiting pro post. I joined in 1982. In 1968, this was in 1986, the Royal Marines took a holiday. And the premise was that, um, that in 1968, we sat on a beach with a young woman with a floppy hat. Because since the Second World War, and indeed right up to the present day, we have been involved in combat operations and lost at least one man every day since. And I joined Fort 2 Commando some years ago as the commanding officer. And my operations officer at the time, John Bailey, said, hello, boss. He said, there are two speeds in this unit, flat out and stop, and stops Christmas Day. And so that business of pacing yourself, this is a marathon and not a sprint. Understanding how your stamina and energy works is also important. You want to be there for the long haul. You want to have enough gas in the tank. How are we doing for time, El Presidente? You, you haven't even looked. <laughs> Quarter past seven. What time do we start? Okay. You better get on with it. Energy. You spoke about energy and now moving. So, in the military realm, one of the most difficult places to fight is the urban one. It's called MOUT, Military Operations in the Urban Terrain, or FIBUA. We love our acronyms. And that is all about pace and rhythm. Because you can't go flat out all the time. You just can't. You just can't. It's a three-dimensional battle space. It's up, sideways, along, and down, sewers. And it gobbles water, beans, bullets, band-aids, and men. And so you have to get used to the whole idea of going flat out, absolutely flat out, and then pausing. Trying, 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 and then stopping. And then recalibrating, gathering yourself, and going again. And so learning how to relax. When I was interrogated, which is a particularly unpleasant experience. One or two others in the audience who probably had that experience. I've been interrogated three times, and you suddenly realize how unbelievably vulnerable you are as an individual. Once after, I'd been on Isla for three and a half weeks without food or shelter in November. So I came out of that experience 37 pounds lighter and feeling a bit woebegone, and then I got interrogated. And then for two and a half weeks afterwards, I couldn't walk into a supermarket without buying everything I saw. Extraordinary. Just think, how pathetic is that? <clears throat> I'd been hungry for three and a half weeks. Not, not starving hungry. I lost 37 pounds. I weighed 200. What, the, what was the relevance of that? Absolutely no idea. But, but, but rhythm and pace is important. So, along with the red words, 
this was the consensus of things which over time, by talking to your colleagues and peers, situating the problem, not the good bits, seem to be part of the challenge. And the delta, the deficit between time, and this applies to GPs quite as much as everybody else, the nine minute slot, and their inability to care to really be the healers and doctors in whatever capacity they wanted to be. And over time, that sort of dislocation of expectation and contract of trust they felt was unhinging. And I suspect somewhere in that lies the reason why typically female GPs leave at 37. There's not a lot of bullshit talked about work-life balance. There is no work-life balance. There's just your life. <clears throat> That's the management speak. You work in volatile, ambiguous, complex and uncertain worlds. And the, 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 the sort of tonic, the, 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 the antidote to that is apparently that. Great. Doesn't really get you much further forward. The challenge is in the clarity and understanding, which is what I'm wittering on about today. If the, you know, I'm not here to give advice. Uh, that would be both, that would be super arrogant of me. And my life is very particular, it is sui generis. But I was thinking about a metaphor as I was driving here today. And I think in some respects, throwing up ideas it's a little bit like sitting in the optician's chair where they drop lenses into your birth control glasses and things swim into focus or don't. And some of these things, I hope, particularly for the younger members of the audience who this is really aimed at, may be of use in bringing things into clearer, clearer frame. Does anybody see this? <clears throat> He's an extraordinary man, Alistair Campbell. He's somebody who lives a deeply authentic individual who lives with real sort of conviction. It was a very, very powerful and moving program about the sort of challenge of the human condition. A man who lifelong has, you know, whether you, you know, like the way he behaved working for Blair or whatever, he still held a remarkably high office and lives with immense conviction. And this was about him struggling on camera with his depression. And you know, videoing himself at three in the morning with a comp the whole topography and planes of his face. He was unrecognizable. Such was the sort of crushing pressure of his affliction. And he went as an experiment to see a whole range of possible people to help him. It was a sort of meditation a, an, an exploration of the, of the breadth of help that was available to people who struggle with mental illness. 30% of you, whether you admit it here or not, in, in the medical profession, have some sort of incipient mental problem. And at the end of it, he spoke at one stage to a lady in, I think she was in America or Canada, who drew this diagram on the wall. You saw the program, ma'am, in the, in the white T-shirt. Can you remember what she drew? She drew a jam jar. And of all the things he heard, this was the most, mo the most revealing to him. And essentially the jam jar was a metaphor for his life. And he became unhinged at the point where there was so much shit piling into the jam jar that it overflowed. And the point where it overflowed, he was then flattened and couldn't, there was a, he had a, in the house that he lived in London, there was a blind on the stairs. And there were days when he couldn't make it to the landing to lift the blind. And that was a, another metaphor for him. And this lady was talking about this jam jar. And she said, there are two ways to look at it. Either you try and avoid all the stuff that's in the jam jar, which is the legacy of stuff in your life, whether you believe in gestalt, 
I don't, I'm not actually a believer in gestalt training, which is whether you regress to the age of two or whatever your first memories were of something which troubles you, and by doing so, you can put it into a better frame. You know, her point was, well, you've sort of got what you've got, and there are ways to, to mitigate and manage that, but essentially, you know, the baggage that you cart around with you is, is what you have. But what you can do is modify the jam jar. And you can raise the neck of that jam jar. And he drew this diagram with a whole load of lines, which, which made the jam jar you know, twice the height up here. So it didn't overflow. And those annuluses, those collars that he put on it to make him more resilient, were the things that buttressed his existence. They were his hinterland. They were the values. They were the things to do with objects, family, beliefs exercise, walking in Glencoe, those things which are central to your ability not to be overwhelmed. On the 3rd of May 1917, 37 divisions of the French army, so pretty much the entire French army in the Western Front mutinied. They all just refused to fight. This was a war of national survival, so they weren't, you know, it wasn't discretionary. They knew that the Germans would ransack France if they didn't fight, and yet they just got to the stage where they just stopped. By 1917, a million French soldiers had died out of a population of 20 million, and four times as many had been wounded. And I, for a number of reasons, looking at the moral component of war, wrote a paper, and I tried to distill the things that undermine, and then I had to draw the sort of salience of them beyond the military realm. And if you like, this is where you want to be. It's written in a slightly sort of military speak. But here, sound morale and discipline. Huzzah. This is the broad sunlit uplands. This is you feeling happy, supported, balanced, confident. And then, if you like, this is the plug hole. To the point where hundreds of thousands of men refused to do what they needed to do. And these are some of the steps that you go through in order to get to the point of mass violent mutiny. And these are the things that can take you there. So the width of the arrow, in my analysis, and this is empirical, it's not, you know, it's not, it was only quasi-scientific, but, but the width of the arrow is the importance, and the length of the arrow is how far that factor will take you from a good place to a bad place. Lack of support from family, lack of communication, dialogue with authorities. Fracturing of primary groups. If you work in a really, really good surgical team, which is fantastically effective and efficient, and then for some reason it just gets smashed up. Failure. Fear. They said the worst I had to fear was fear itself. I know no greater lie. I fear no fear. I fear no fear of fear. I fear one fearful thing. I fear to die. The boys will die, but they won't die needlessly. Lack of information. Sometimes you can just get completely, literally blown away by something. And the shock, the psychological shock of it is such that you just, you rock back on your heels and you struggle to come to terms with it. My wife walked out on me without any warning with my three-year-old daughter. That's what made me suicidal. Shock. I've got my story backwards. There's no logic to any of it. How are you, Mountain? <coughs> I'm fine, thanks. Good. What's your name? Anne. Anne. Nice to meet you, Anne. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Richard. Richard. And you, sir? Richard. Richard. <laughs> Anybody any other Richards in there? <laughs> so the definition of a bore is a man who, when you ask him how he is, tells you. <laughs> and we went from fine to very good. 
If I shook hands in an American audience, I'd start with awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just sort of go upwards from awesome. There will be people in the audience today, and I've given presentations which have included this bit to 10,000 people before now, big auditorium. And in that, I don't know what the number would be, but it would be substantial. But there are people in this audience today who, whether it's small grains of sand toppling or big ones, are struggling with big problems. You know, you may have a parent who's dying, you may <coughs> lack confidence in what you're doing, you may have an unhappy marriage, you, you may be sick, there could be a multiplicity of things. And if I shook your hand and asked you how you were, you'd say, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> but the question then in a working environment, and this, you know, I've, the small L of leadership in this presentation, all this is, infuses that, because you will be in charge of people, even if it's only one, is how you legitimise a dialogue which is appropriate. What's appropriate? It depends on the environment, doesn't it? And increasingly, it's increasingly difficult. It's increasingly difficult to have conversation with people. When I was a general, there were 17 ranks between me and my Marines, which is quite a lot. It's quite an unbridgeable gap. You know, I was a, metaphorically a bit like a god to them. They were nervous of me because I was very powerful. And the way that I would close the gap, always with them, always, was to touch them. Always. And if we were in an informal enough environment in the field or something, I'd hug them. They were like my sons. What's your name, man? Joanna. So I just touched Joanna. She didn't say I could touch her. Touching somebody like taking their photograph, can be construed as assault unless they give you permission to. So where does that, that simple human tactile thing of interaction now, it's become complicated. It's freighted with all sorts of difficulty. And that interaction, that knowing. Eliza Manning and Buller, who used to run MI5, used to send birthday cards to everybody like the Queen. Queen starts writing Christmas cards in January. Got on her Christmas card list. Um, Eliza Manning and Buller used to send, and you can say, well, that's completely bogus. She had two and a half thousand people who worked for her. But I used to write lots of letters between midnight and two, because I worked 120 hours a week. And the people who worked for me, who realized that I was like a zombie quite a lot of the time, so you can give up doing lots of things, boss, but you can't stop writing letters. So how do you sort of, how do you reach out to people? How do you close that stranger's gap? How do you get to the point where if you ask somebody how they are, they will tell you? Anybody know who this geezer is? Are there any Northern Irishmen in the house? That's Ronnie Flanagan. On the 4th of November, 2001, he did an incredible thing. Probably the most, he, he was a re remarkable man. Remarkable man. He was an absolutely brilliant geezer. Yeah. I met him a few times when I was in trouble in Northern Ireland. Sorry. Anyway, he took over the Royal Ulster Constabulary as the chief constable and had to move it to become the police constabulary of PCNI of Northern Ireland. And it was, at the time, a deeply tarnished, partial, Protestant organisation. And because he was a copper, above his door of his office, every time he walked out of the door, he would look up, and above his door was Lockhart's theory of forensic transfer. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Long winter evenings fly by when you read stuff like that. And essentially what it said was every contact leaves a trace. What's your name, man? Cat. Cat, nice to meet you. Every contact. So some of Cat's DNA is now on my hand, and some of mine is on hers. And the more senior you become in an organisation, the more significant that trace becomes. If I wasn't some 
idiotic retired general, and I was Barack Obama. There will probably be one or two pe more people in this room. Possibly. <laughs> and when you walked out, you would have told everybody that you got a ticket in Exeter Grilled, whatever this weird building is, <laughs> to listen to Barack Obama. I've met Barack Obama a couple of times. He's very tall. There are lots of other qualities about him, but he's very tall. And you'd have been halfway out of the door before you'd been on your mobile phone saying, oh my God, he's as charismatic as everybody said he was. And so that sort of vicariousness of position. So the more senior you are, the more you can't have a bad day, the more you absolutely leave a trace, which is both your strength and your vulnerability. And part of the sort of the... the, the Part of the responsibility that then lies on you is consistency. This is why anger is so toxic when you're in charge, the death rattle and reason. We used to have generations of people. When I first joined in the Cold War, I worked for generals. I was an ADC to a general who was a complete raging fury. Are you her husband? No, because uh, I know her husband is a bootneck and I'm trying to make the link. <laughs> so Robin Ross was my boss for two years and I was his sort of bag man and he used to smash telephones to pieces and throw them out of the car he was in charge of the maritime special forces at the time so that wasn't only really helpful but there were generations of people who used to scream and shout and then when we rediscovered the things our fathers well understood the, real, <coughs> the reality of war the people who ended up in charge became calmer and calmer because they were promoted through environments which demanded that they were rational. So here's the burn model. At which point, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine. And most of us, I keep on flash, I keep on putting the laser jet up there, which is classic me. Live down here. Conversational enablers, they're called. We talk about sport. In fact, we talk about the weather. The biggest British conversational enabler is the weather. Keep going for hours on the subject of the weather. You're none the wiser. Everybody's happy. <laughs> it's all good. Long winter and evenings again. I spent a week once just as an experiment on the underground. I used to work right in central London in Whitehall, and I decided, right, I'm going to talk to people on the underground. Don't try that, folks. <laughs> you can clear whole carriages. <laughs> on the third day, I was cautioned by the transport police. <laughs> Very good, officer. What have I done? Not entirely sure, sir, but you need to stop doing it. <laughs> so the Americans... For, for, for Americans, it's sport, and it, you can be morbidly obese, but you'll know everything you need to know about yardage and baseball or football or whatever. I have driven up the burn model very significantly today, and in a way completely, yes, thank you, I'm just, thank you for looking behind you, up the burn model very significantly today, and, and at the risk of utterly and inappropriately oversharing with you. In order to strike common cause, I'm not looking for sympathy. This is my life. I've rotted it up. In the military, they say the only place you find sympathy is in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. Which <laughs> <laughs> is doctors you might appreciate. But you need to get here with people before they'll tell you whether you're, they're all right or not. And this requires disclosure. This requires you to show yourself as a human being. And at that point, you get rapport, you get engagement. You hold people in your hand. <coughs> gloss over that. Um, I'm going to gloss over that as well. So most of us wear a mask at work. We sort of put on a uniform, we pick up our stethoscope, we put on our scrubs, we put on whatever it might be. And it is important that you align 
You have to do the work to find out what a small quivering vanity, which is I, is. And then find a way of being that person as much as you are able. Not the 62% of people who bend themselves out of shape in order to fit in at work. When I was about the 15 year point, I was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Marines and a very, very good friend of mine called Richard Vanderhorst, who was the commanding officer of the Special Boat Service, drowned. Well, he wasn't on operations. He was working on something called the Swimmer Delivery Vehicle, which is a sort of midget submarine, which was in the World War II U-boat pens in North Norway, very cold water, but they were training. It was very straightforward. He was surrounded by the most experienced divers in the world, and he drowned. He lost his mask. And it came as a massive shock to me, because A, he was the sort of bloke that you had to stop with an anti-tank missile. He was incredibly talented, and I just wasn't ready for it. And he coned. So he made his brain force itself down his spinal column. And his wife switched the machine off in Oslo. And at that point, I, I, it forced me to take really serious stock of my life. It was a big shock, liminality. And at that point, I thought, you know what? One of the responsibilities of your friends dying is that you need to live with greater conviction and passion. You carry on on their behalf as well as your own. But you also think, well, you know, it's part of the quivering vanity bit. And if you're masquerading, you're trying to fit in rather than being who you are. Not so much. And so I sort of made, I can remember sitting on a hill in Wiltshire after, the, after his memorial service and trying to draw some sustainable lessons from what I thought about. And the weird thing was that I sort of let go of a whole load of things. And from that point, it's, you know, it's like looking at, a, at the inflection point in a campaign. It's called the campaign fulcrum. You can never see it ahead of time. You can only see it looking back. At that point, my career took off. When I had the conviction to be myself rather than the thing or the simulacrum of myself that I thought the organisation demanded, and the training and indoctrination of the Marines is very powerful. It's an extremely powerful culture. And it's quite possible to take rather perverse conclusions from that. How are we doing for time? I don't have delayed, Maureen. Because now I can I stop at any time. Shall I stop or carry on? Carry on. Okay. I'll keep going for a bit. When people start to throw things. You can heckle. I did, I've, I've, I've omitted to mention that. Mm -hmm. Audience participation is a good thing. I usually ask more questions. I'm not sure why I haven't. Done that. Yeah, so this bit about, you know, your public and private faces and authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no apologist for this man. I'm no apologist for him. But... There's a friend of mine who's a Yorkshireman, and he has a sort of, he, he finished as a knight of the realm and a general. And he said, the further up you climb the tree, the more you're sure you're bum. Mm. <laughs> and the most, <laughs> the most important thing you have in your professional realm is your reputation. And it, it's a little bit like, you know, when you do, GCSEs and you ace them <clears throat> and then you go to do your A-levels and if you plough your A-levels it it's, 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 a, it's a compound thing it's like a Ponzi scheme isn't it because all the effort you put into that is nothing if you screw this up and then you get to university and you get through your medical school and you're like ha oh, hurrah and then you're on to F1 and you're sort of head down and you're on this treadmill and this, and this concern and then you know as you get one chance to make him first impression in the corps is when you get off the train at Limston Commando and you wheel your luggage. You're never allowed to wheel your luggage in the Royal Marines. If you can't carry it, then you shouldn't have it. <laughs> you know, you wheel your luggage in your mum's pink suitcase <laughs> with your teddy bear tucked under your arm and there's some hideous wool rust sergeant major sitting in the corner office trying to unlive that. 
that wasn't quite me, but 34 years later, people still reminded me of things that I did which were similar. And so you guard your reputation. On a serious note, you know, if you are a good cutter, if you're a really good surgeon or a really good something, and you become risk averse. You don't like doing things that will make you foolish. You think you have to be sort of omniscient. People who, the people who work for you don't want you, don't expect you to know all the answers if you don't pretend to. They are much, much happier with you being a human being with them. And his genius is that as a politician, as I say, I'm no apologist for him, is that he does that. You know, if, if, if David Cameron had been strung up on a zip wire whilst trying to advertise the London Olympics, that would have been it. Game over. So he tries stuff. And now, you know, I mean, his brand is quite seriously contaminated, but... <laughs> Now listen to him. Now listen to him. Be very clear. I was saving that up. I mean, I could have done it any time. You know? <laughs> so there's the metaphor. There's the bit above. There's the bit you will show to me. And there's the bit below, which you generally don't show to people. And you'll recognise that Freud used that iceberg model, very standard model for the bit below the water matters. So that's a rather long quote. It's a clever, it's a, it's a beautiful quote. For those of you who are studying, I just think it's a fantastic evocation of what education really is. The art of assuming at a moment's notice a new intellectual position, the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, the habit of submitting to censure and reputation, the art of indicating assent and dissent in graduated terms, the habit of regarding minute points of accuracy, the art of working out what is possible in a given time, for taste, for discrimination, for mental courage and mental soberness, and above all, <coughs> you go to a great school for self-knowledge. Mm. Success, and there have been enormous, stochastic, rigorous psychological studies. I can't remember the name of the lady who did most in America. She did the most amazing piece of empirical about genius. Genius is much, much more about emotional intelligence or success than it is about intellect. So there are five, include this little guy, six generations <coughs> now in the work, not in the workplace, in society. There are four in the workplace. There are, I can't remember what they, brain's gone blank. They start with, where are we? Then they become Generation X. Traditionalists, Generation X, Generation, sorry, Traditionalists, Baby Boomers, IR1, finished in 1964. Generation X, Generation Y, they're the snowflakes. Generation Z, who've just started at university. And if you're born before 20, after 2012, then you're a child and you don't have a, you don't, you don't have a, a, a thing at the moment. <laughs> and where are we? I've got, oh, here we go. So snowflakes, unfocused, entitled, flaky, lazy, narcissistic, indecisive, self-absorbed and picky. Nice. That's a vote of confidence for your entire generation, isn't it? That's the characterization which I pulled off the internet of Snowflake. Generation Z, what is the greatest reward associated with work for Gen, Generation Y and Generation Z? What do you reckon it is? This is the audience participation point, folks. Any idea? Has it a guess? Success. Time off. <laughs> Gig generation, that's what they want. So the balance of life. 
thing that will sell them the job is not doing the job. <laughs> Which is why, apparently, in Plymouth, I was talking to a boy who's doing his F1 in Derriford, something like only 20% of people who can apply when they theoretically can apply to specialise towards consultancy currently are. That doesn't mean to say they won't. I may have that statistic slightly wonky. So part of the challenge of you and your environment is fusing together these people who in 10-year increments have a profoundly different view of life. It's not just ethnicity or upbringing or whatever. It's a generational shift. You are not talking to their listening. You don't understand what it is they hold dear or important in as much as you can generalise. But people do, and, and in some respects, sustainably. On the other end of the spectrum, there are, by 2021, there will be more people in the world who are over 65 than there are under five. 25% of people in prison in Japan are over 60. There are more diapers sold to the elderly in Japan than to newborns. We live in an age that where, with the tyranny of youth, how we think about age needs to change. You will know this better than I. So this thing about trust, talked about the T word. Trust is fantastic paradox. It's both the glue and the lubricant of life. In some respects, it's absolute. When it's lost, my goodness, it's a difficult thing to recover. And if you have it, everything just goes with a zip. You don't send emails. The reason why do people send emails? I used to get 200 emails a day, 300 probably. Why do you send an email when you could just tap somebody in the shoulder? Because you want an evidence. You want an evidence train. You want to say that you asked, what's your name, sir, with the glasses? I'm Gavin. I want, to, I want to know, I want an email which said, I asked Gavin to do this. Because then if Gavin doesn't do it, I've got a piece of paper which says Gavin didn't do it. And the way that organisations and bureaucracies get clarted with this stuff, because people, there isn't a collective intuition, there isn't a collective trust. And so you, you know, process, bureaucracy, procedure builds up, which is why when small companies have catastrophic success and grow really fast, they quite often then blow up. Because the trust that they had, the informal trust and understanding they had, then has to be replaced with a whole load of processes and procedures and things. And they can't make the change. How do you foster trust if you're leading? Well, some of it's about that. Particularly that. And this thing is the zinger. So coming back to reputation, credibility is can you do what you say you'll do? Do you know your stuff? Are you competent? More, more important than in most professions, I would suggest, as doctors. Reliability is do you do what you say you'll do? Always. Are you a person of your word? And that is quite an absolute thing. And increasingly rare, if I might say so. It staggers me how people just, just don't do. They just don't follow through. It's, it's, it's sort of endemic. We live, we live in an age of entitlement, play on words. The age of entitlement, where people are so firmly, and there are endless books about not giving a fuck. You'll have seen them which celebrates the notion of being selfish. And then intimacy. You need to be seen to be believed. Go back to this business of being a human being, of reaching out, of interaction, of humanity. And then this thing. Is it about the organisation? Is it about the common good? Or is it about you? Is this a vehicle?
Who's heard of Robin Dunbar? What, what's his gig? What's his gig? Yes. Would you like to explain it? It's a, it's a social grouping size, evolutionary uh, relevant grouping size for a human. So it's about 150. Correct. Right. Well, are you a psychologist, sir? No, I'm a anesthetist. Anesthetist. <laughs> He's got time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> I get to do a lot of reading. This is my opportunity to put you to sleep. Hurrah. So Dunbar's number is exactly that, 150. And uh, so he, he was a primatologist and a psychologist, a very interesting man. And he figured out that actually people, apes, you can only get your arms around 150 people because relationship takes energy and effort. And it's interesting because when you first command in the military, you're a troop commander, you have 34 people. And then the next time, if you're lucky, you get a company and there are 150. And then the next time, if you're even luckier, you get a battalion, which is about 800. At that point, even though as an infantier, you get spurs on your boots. Because time was on the battlefield that you couldn't communicate with those people without being on an horse. 150. And it's not about, in chimpanzee colonies, food or the ability to fight off marauding you know, groups next door. It's about the ability to be able to know and understand. And part of the problem with social media is that it stretches that. And, but the analysis he's done still brings him back down to this figure. And some of the problem with the resilience that people have is their understanding of these annuluses, and these are sort of random pictures, well, they're not random actually, that the people who, at various stages in my life, have meant the most to me. And Dunbar's figure goes 5, 15, 25, 50, 150, and then he sort of poses two outside that. What's my point? My point is, it's quite an interesting exercise because along with balance, it's quite possible to go through your life and take the people that you care about most for granted. Because they're there until they're not. And so figuring out who sits in these circles, because the imbalance of spending too much time on your students and not enough time on your kids, whatever that is, you know, who sits where on this circle? Because I've known people with really major mental difficulties because they have such an enhanced sense of responsibility that they spread themselves wildly too thin. And you're back to this issue of marathon and not a sprint. You know, who are the people you draw strength from? Who are they? Anybody recognize this bloke? Who? Close, Lawrence. You know, so there's some random geezers there. That's Fessiger, and you ever met him once? Anybody read any of his books? Yeah. Anyway. That is um, Antoine de saint Exupéry. Anyway, so some of my heroes are in there as well. Who's this bloke? We've just been through the... Um, anniversary, which I thought was incredibly moving, of the 50 years since Apollo 11. And there's that lovely apocryphal thing about asking the man at, at um, Cape Canaveral, who's brushing the floor, what he does for a living. He says, I send men into space. Whether that's actually true or not, what a genius thing. So there were three men. Nobody ever remembers Collins, Michael Collins. But there were three men in Apollo 11 sitting on the top of that Saturn V rocket, which was about the size of Nelson's column. How many bits were in it? How many bits were in, Nels in Nelson's column? Not so many. In that Saturn V rocket. Come on. Wakey, wakey, he's going to give me an estimate. Two million. Two million. Two million. Five and a half. Five and a half million pieces. 
How many people worked at NASA at the time in order to put those three men, two men, on the moon? 400,000. 17,000 intimately involved, 400,000 people were involved in that moonshot. 400,000. The genius of Apollo 11 wasn't the technical challenge, which in itself was prodigious. What was the processing power of the lunar module? Less than a mobile phone. Less than a mobile phone. The, like war, more than anything, it was a human endeavour. And when they went around the world afterwards and met people from every nationality, the most common reaction they got was, we did it. The genius of the human condition is cooperation. And the reason, being half American, why the Americans are such a successful nation is because they got that taped. Part of it's national, you know, they're German in there, they're much more German than they are anything else, and they organise and cooperate. We used to do lots of mud runs. How are we doing for time? We need to stop. Do I need to stop? Speak if I need to stop. Okay, okay, let me just, I'm going to bounce on to any amount of this stuff. I'm sorry about it. Oof. That was loud, sorry. <laughs> so this is an interesting thing. I'm winding down, another three minutes. I talked a little bit about instinct and Kleinsian decision making and intuition. And we sort of live in an age where we are institutionally doubtful about trusting what we can't measure. I think Einstein said, not all that measures matters and not all that matters can be measured. So there's a light in the darkness. So you're now standing, you're sitting on the Radon top above a Thorverton, and it's perfectly black. And it's an entirely still night. And somebody has lit a candle. How far do you think you could see it from? Two miles. The advance on two miles. Any advance on five and a half million? Five miles. Five miles. Amazing. Brilliant, the strength of, of sunlight. What does that say? Everything and nothing, really, I guess. I think it's a brilliant metaphor, though. Most of this is metaphorical. So let me find a good place to stop. I haven't scratched the surface, you'll be pleased to hear. So these are all models. If you've got a notebook and you're interested, write some of these things down. That's an extraordinary thing. Started 800 AD, 846 AD. So it's a very, very old Japanese idea about balance in life, and it's deeply sophisticated. You know, it's not an airport book which tells you how to live happily. It's something which has survived the test of a thousand years. That's quite an interesting one. Self-directed learning. This is how I am. This is how I want to be. Would have seen that one, I'm sure. Let's see. You in? <laughs> Bear with me. I'll get there. Maybe I'll stop here, which is about multiple lenses. So, typically, you know, you'll all have heard that story about the Sunday Times having more information than the average man had access to in his entire life in the 17th century. So we're sort of, we're submerged by information and the ephemera and speed at which stuff comes at us. And Martin Luther King talked about the paralysis of analysis. And the idea that you just have to be laser-like in your focus in order to master anything. I have a different view, and I think polymathy 
wide and varied learning. It has great merit still. It is part of fostering a hinterland. I read um, Michelle Obama's biography um, last year, which was remarkable. And she described um, Barak in her book, Becoming, her husband, as a man who took an improvisational zigzag through disparate worlds, a strange mix of everything, man. And when I learned to climb in the Royal Marines, I used to teach us to tie a bowlin, a, a knot, eight different times, eight different ways, with your left hand, like this, like that, with your right hand, with your toes. Because you never really knew when you might end up on the Metaleggy Ridge with a shattered shoulder. And you could only tie it one way. And that was like this. And I think that the ability to improvise, which is increasingly important in an uncertain world, and to be your own multidisciplinary team, is to come back to my metaphor of opticians and lenses, about having multiple lenses on which to look at the world, multiple lenses. Part of the multiple lenses is language, and I haven't got to language, and I haven't got to a whole load of other things. I've written down everything of interest I've read since I was 18. My mother gave me a lovely book, Il Papiro book from Firenze, from Florence. And it needs to be a ritual, because if you write it on bits of paper and stuff it in a box, you'll lose it. You think, what a completely barking thing to do. There's the internet. You can find anything on the internet. No, you can't. No, you can't. And so the process of curiosity, Einstein's bit, you know, imagination is more important than knowledge. Curiosity is more important than intellect. Combined with wide and varied sort of curiosity. And you will see something. Wound the sound up. I'm sorry about this. I'm just going to get to this last bit and then I'll shut up. I'm glad that you don't have to sit through all this dribble. <laughs> I haven't talked about loneliness. Okay, so I mean, I've been going for about 40 years and I'll have written something down about fear. And I'll go, huh, fear, and I'll look at it from there. You use something called axial tomography in med medicine, don't you, to look at something through three dimensions to better understand it. Is that the right expression, sir? Pardon? That's what CAT scan CAT scan, CAT -scan. CAT -scan. thank you, that's simple. Nice acronym, CAT scan. Mm -hmm. And the CAT scan gives you a view of the brain. I have a view of fear, which I wrote in one of these books in 1993. And then you'll read a book of a thousand pages dignified by a single paragraph. And you'll get rid of the book or you will forget where it is. And then some years later, I'll be reading something and I'll find something else about fear. And some years later again, I'll be reading something and I'll find something else about fear. And by recording this in a purely, um, all it is is in, what's the name of time? What's time? When things are in time order. Chronological, thank you. Chronological order. All it is is chronological, but I can, I can recognise my handwriting as it's changed over the years. I, you'll end up with a better understanding of fear because you'll have multiple prisms on the things that have resonated with you. And at that point, before we all turn to wooden tops, I'll stop. Thank you. I didn't get to the bit where you have to sing. You're lucky. <laughs> Enough already. Thank you. Thank you.